For the second interview of this series, I'm being joined by Dr. Hodson. And Dr. Hodson is a professor of Emeritus with the School of Environmental Sciences at Queen's, uh, as well as biology. And his research focuses around fish toxicology, and that includes the effect of oil spills on rivers. That's correct. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you got interested in environmental sciences? Well, the, the, um, <clears throat> my interest really started with fish, um, mm -hmm. because I grew up in uh, West Quebec near Ottawa, and we used to uh, play on the Ottawa River a good deal, and I used to go fishing. So mm -hmm. fishing was a lot of fun, and uh, so I got interested in fish and what makes them uh, um, numerous, what makes them uh, unhealthy, what the effect of water quality might be on fish. Mm -hmm. And um, so went to Miguel, and as most people in West Quebec did in those days, and the um, uh, kind of courses I took were really just general biology until I got into uh, uh, second and third year and started to focus on physiology. Mm -hmm. And um, my interest after that was trying to apply physiological type um, approaches to looking at um, effects of water quality on fish. Oh, and okay. that's what I did in my master's and PhD degrees. Mm -hmm. So you went directly from environmental sciences combined with fish toxicology? Well, in, in those days, environmental sciences didn't exist. We had no departments for the environment. There was mm -hmm. no, uh, environment wasn't a category on its own. Um, there were people who were starting to study those things. Um, and um, so my degrees were in biology and zoology. And uh, oh, so okay. somewhat uh, um, specialization within those categories. Mm -hmm. so. uh, what has been your most memorable moment as a researcher so far? Well, I think the, um, the really satisfying and interesting parts is when you realize that your research gets, is contributing to public policy in some way or resolving an issue that is uh, um, pressing for the government and the uh, and public in general. And so I was, um, started my career with the Great Lakes Laboratory of Fisheries and Oceans in uh, Burlington, Ontario. And um, I got to sit on committees of the International Joint Commission, which were um, focused on trying to develop uh, standards or guidelines or criteria objectives for water quality in the Great Lakes, so for various kinds of metals, organics, and so on. So that was directly translating science into policy. Um, those oh, well, numbers yeah. became uh, very useful for governments to be able to say, okay, the water quality is degraded or it's improving or, or whatever. And then uh, later on, I think uh, another big thrill was in uh, helping Canada revise their pulp and paper mill um, effluent regulations, which uh, Canada was the first country in the world to require a biological test of effluents, starting back in the late, late 70s, early 80s, I believe. And um, they decided they would uh, revise their regulations, bring them up to date. So we got involved in a program of research, which ultimately led to um, a whole new program of monitoring by looking at the receiving environment. So instead of just doing little bioassays with puddles of effluent in the laboratory, Mm -hmm. uh, people were now starting to go out into the real world and see whether or not any of the predicted effects actually occurred. And of course what we found was that there were a whole bunch of things happening that nobody ever uh, anticipated. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ultimately came up with a, um, a set piece uh, environmental effects monitoring program that all the mills had to do to demonstrate that they weren't having impacts on um, receiving waters. And if they were having impacts, then they had to uh, go through a series of uh, process improvements to try and uh, get rid of those impacts. So that, I mean, really felt like we contributed something to improving yeah. the, the environment. Uh, pulp mills are all over Canada, so that was a, that was a good uh, opportunity. Yeah, so on at least two occasions you've affected policies and yeah. political... and it continues with the oil staff as well. I mean, it's, it, uh, it's, those are just two examples of things that are kind of neat. Well, it's amazing. A large portion of your previous research focused around polyaromatic hydrocarbons and the toxicity associated with their metabolism in fish. Right. Um, could you tell us about what makes the polyaromatic hydrocarbons so toxic? Well, the, um, those compounds are composed of benzene rings arranged in plates, so they're fused together. And um, benzene rings are notoriously difficult to metabolize because um, the uh, structure is very uh, well stabilized by the aromatic sharing of electrons. These compounds showed up in pulp mills, believe it or not, um, because mm -hmm. bacteria uh, in sediments converted abiotic acid, which comes out of plants and trees, it's a resinous compound, converted that by a process of anaerobic aromatization into a pH, a pH with alkyl side chains. And um, so that was kind of interesting. And um, one of the characteristic features of pulp mill effluents was that they caused 
increased activities of what are called the cytochrome P450 enzymes, which you may have come across in some of your pharmacology or biochemistry courses. And uh, these enzymes are responsible for breaking the double bonds in mm -hmm. aromatic rings. And so the, a lot of very persistent compounds can actually be um, oxygenated through these enzymes and as a result um, made into reactive intermediates, which combine with uh, amino acid allows the, or the cell to uh, then excre excrete it through some sort of uh, drug pump on the cell membrane. Mm -hmm. um, so this whole process of inducing these enzymes, the enzymes uh, adding oxygen and allowing these compounds to be excreted is a really important defense mechanism for these, uh, uh, any animal that's exposed to these compounds. So the persistent observation of uh, cyclin A induction downstream of pulp mills mm -hmm. said, okay, there must be compounds there that are uh, causing these effects. And in those days, everybody thought it was chlorinated dioxins and furans, which are produced by the bleaching, chlorine bleaching in pulp mills. Mm -hmm. And in those days, Greenpeace was saying that chlorine was the devil of all the compounds. It was the <laughs> okay. all, the, all the elements. And um, so we, we did a series of studies, um, and this is part of this pulp mill uh, program, where we found that um, we could take effluent from mills that did not use bleaching, and you'd still get this effect. So oh, okay. there was something coming out of wood. The problem wasn't the chlorine, the problem was the wood. There was something being extracted that um, either was inducing these enzymes in fish directly or bacteria were converting to that kind of compound. So we eventually identified this compound and it was um, uh, an alkyl phenanthrene. And it was right at that time that I came to uh, Queens from the government. And um, it became very difficult to get money to do pulp mill research because the price of pulp worldwide was dropping. A lot of competition from countries all over the world who had cheaper labor and cheaper forests. Mm -hmm. um, so about that time, research was coming out on the Exxon Valdez, and uh, the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska was very heavily studied. It was one of the most um, intensively studied oil spills in the world, in part because television was there and could document what was going on. So yeah. a lot of interest. And it turned out that they were able to associate some of the effects on fish embryos with the um, presence of uh, polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. And um, it turns out that most of the pH in oil are um, alkylated, so alkyl side chains. Whereas we think of the US EPA priority 16 uh, pH, they're non alkylated and they're air pollutants, they're things that come out as products of combustion. So here was a whole new class of pH that were effectively shown being associated with uh, serious harm to fish in the Gulf of, uh, um, what do you call it, the Gulf of Alaska, um, mm -hmm. Prince, Prince William Sound, and um, an area that's very rich in fisheries. And so we suddenly realized that we weren't studying pulp affluence, we were studying oil pollution. Because <laughs> 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 this compound <laughs> that we had been very interested in was actually present in oil. Yeah. And um, so that then led us to looking at the um, various kinds of pH and the degree of alkyl substitution and determining whether or not there's any relationship between alkyl substitution and toxicity mm -hmm. and alkyl substitution and ability to induce cyclin A enzymes. And uh, it, when you think about it, these compounds all have a shape that fits a lot of receptors in normal cellular biology. So these are, are not that different to uh, any other compound that you have in your metabolism, any other aromatic compound, mm -hmm. and very, very similar to dioxins, furans, and some of the PCBs. So um, it would appear that the shape of the molecule determines its behavior, and potentially its potency for inducing cyclin A enzymes, and potentially toxicity. So those are the kinds of things we started to uh, investigate. And it turned out also that metabolism by the cyclin A enzymes plays a role not only in detoxification, but also in making these things more toxic. Which was kind of interesting. Oh, that's interesting. How does, how does that work well, specifically? The, the, uh, if you have an acute exposure to a high concentration of pH, you can um, kill an organism um, very quickly. It's a, a lethal effect uh, due to probably interaction with the membrane processes. So a lot of membranes just cease functioning um, almost like an anesthetic. Mm -hmm. But if you have cyclin A uh, enzymes induced at the same time, the animal can metabolize and excrete those uh, pH, and the concentrations very quickly drop below the lethal level, and the animal will die. So it's a great protective mechanism. But if you get into a chronic exposure, 
it turns out that the metabolites themselves have toxicity. So when we think of something like benzoapyrene, it's the um, um, double hydroxylated epoxide compounds, dial epoxides of benzoapyrene that cause cancer because they can covalently bind with um, parts of DNA, the parts that have uh, double bonds. And so you end up with a um, DNA molecule that doesn't quite replicate the way it should, uh, right. doesn't do what it's supposed to, and in some cells that may lead then to um, uh, cancerous growth. You start to get an uncontrolled cell replication. So that's one, one end of the scale. The other end of the scale is that a lot of the um, hydroxyl group or hydroxylated versions of uh, PAH um, can interact with receptors. So um, I think there's work developing now, on uh, which I haven't done yet, or our lab hasn't done, on um, endocrine disruption because a lot of the um, hormones uh, involved in sexual maturation and sexual function uh, look uh, very much like um, pH, they're steroids, those series of uh, right. um, yeah. benzene rings joined with hydroxyl groups and alkyl groups and lo and behold, that's a pH because the animal is converting uh, egg yolk protein into structural proteins, enzymes, and so on. And so it's continually breaking stuff down and spitting off reactive oxygen species. So you add that extra stress of pH and you can overwhelm that antioxidant defense system. And so we end up with signs of toxicity that look very much like oxidative stress. So a lot of interesting things going on, and, and there's also some direct relationships with cardiac development. So you end up with um, fish that are unable to uh, uh, have very poor performance, either in oxygen stress tests or in swimming tests, once they get beyond the uh, embryo stage. Mm -hmm. So there are these kind of delayed sublethal effects that can ultimately affect performance in the uh, status of the population. Have you done these tests here at Queen's yourself? We, we haven't done the um, um, cardiac work. Well, we, we, you can see it physically as the animal develops because the heart doesn't form properly and you end up oh. with the blood flow in extreme cases just stopping. Um, but we've certainly done a lot of work on the antioxidant part. And uh, our work has been shared with um, Val Langlois, Dr. Langlois, who's now gone to Quebec. Uh, and we've done a series of experiments on um, um, genomic or molecular responses that reflect uh, oxidative stress. So um, there's a bunch of things going on. And the, the problem with the pH is that if you look at the two to, say, five or six ring compounds and all the potential alkylated derivatives with one to four carbon atoms added on, there's more than 10,000 compounds. And so you can imagine the numbers of molecular shapes and hence the numbers of receptors you can interact with. And so the numbers of mechanisms of toxicity is huge. Oh, wow. So it's really diverse. Um, what are some key properties of a good biomarker? Biomarkers can be anything related to a biological response to a chemical insult, or even a physical insult, I suppose, that's consistent, repeatable, and diagnostic of that exposure. And the uh, problem with a lot of biomarkers is that either they don't respond to a great enough extent that you can reliably discriminate them from background, or they don't show a good dose-response relationship to the chemical exposure, and therefore they, they're just you know, saying that that response represents an effect on the fish, sometimes very, very difficult. Um, and so at the moment, we don't have any really solid biomarker responses other than morphological changes in embryos. The, we talked a lot about cytochrome P450, and the beauty of that is that you get this massive response um, Typical gene responses that we've observed in most things are on the order of two to ten fold difference from controls, if they respond at all. Cyclin A induction starts at ten and can go up to a thousand, several thousand fold. I mean, mm -hmm. you get this giant peak of, of, uh, of activity of enzyme or of um, mRNA being produced, and it's incredibly reliable, um, mm -hmm. assuming that the compounds that it's exposed to are those that induce the uh, system. So it's a really, really useful biomarker of exposure, but there's a huge debate around whether it's a biomarker of effect because there are so many different uh, potential mechanisms of toxicity. So it could represent um, an important result if the mechanism is oxidative stress, because obviously that represents an enzyme that's really starting to turn over substrate fast and incorporate a lot of oxygen. Um, mm -hmm. It could represent um, a um, interaction with the aryl hydrocarbon receptor protein, which is the very first step in the pH activating the synthesis of cyclin A. 
um, ends up. So there's a whole molecular series of events that occur. So the aryl hydrocarbon receptor protein sits around in the uh, in the uh, cytosol um, stabilized by heat shock protein, and when a chemical can enter the the cytosol that fits the AHR active site, then those will migrate into the um, nucleus and away it goes. The whole system starts uh, activating. The interesting thing is that the, the cytochrome P450 gene is part of the chromosome and there's a lot of downstream genes. And so when you get that um, gene being activated, often there are other genes that are activated um, simultaneously. And there's something in the order of Three to 6,000 genes that are only active during embryonic development. And so if you activate those, even some of them at an inappropriate time or for an inappropriate duration, then that may explain why we get some of the uh, deformities and pathologies you see in, in uh, fish embryos. The problem is that there are so many mechanisms that we haven't really nailed down exactly what CIP1A induction means in every single case. Right, you might not be able to attribute it to... No, yeah. but in, for, in terms of oil, it is excellent in the sense that you can say, okay, the fish have been exposed to oil, you know, it's clear evidence. Right. Um, and we're now starting to just simply relate the degree of symptom induction to the degree of pathology in fish that have been affected by oil. And that seems to be a relatively stable relationship. And if you look at the concentration that causes symptom induction, it's very sensitive, so it turns on well before you see pathology. But you start seeing pathology well before the cyclin A maxes out. So it seems like there's some threshold of cyclin A induction, if it's persistent, that's going to lead to pathology. We're looking to implement uh, E. coli to find a novel way of um, cleaning up oil spills in the Arctic. Sure. I know that introducing a new organism into a different environment might affect the different populations living there. Would you think that introducing E. coli into the Arctic waters might affect some of the fish populations there? It's, it's a really difficult uh, thing to say. I mean, the old law of unintended consequences. If we knew those things in advance, then we wouldn't do it. And we would avoid it. But, yeah. but often um, these things come out of nowhere by some mechanism or, or uh, route that we don't understand. Uh, and if we, had to say, if we hadn't understood it, we wouldn't have done it. So there is always that risk. Um, certain E. coli are taken up um, by organisms. Um, I mean, found in the gut of most um, mammals, mm -hmm. and bacteria uh, are known to um, exchange DNA, and, and um, you can end up with um, um, some rather interesting organisms uh, being produced. So I'm not enough of an expert in that area to be able to say, but I would say, right. you know, obviously it's something to think about very <laughs> carefully. Yes, that's true. Could you tell us a little bit about, about chemical dispersants? Yeah, chemical dispersants are. Um, have been proven to be very useful in the open ocean to spread oil around. I mean, the, the old story, the solution to pollution is dilution, still holds. Mm -hmm. um, and even if that was the end of it, even if the oil just got diluted, that would be a useful thing to do. The um, problem is several fold though. One is that um, in the transition from high concentrations to very low concentrations, you're moving that oil off the surface and into the, the uh, water column. So that means that after you've applied a dispersant, the concentration in the water column increases quite remarkably. And it will dilute out eventually, depending on currents. Mm -hmm. But it can also be entrained in water masses and move quite some distance without dilution. And so any organisms that also happen to be in that water mass are going to be exposed to any uh, dispersed oil and any dispersant that hasn't mixed with oil. And that's where the problem comes in. So what we see in laboratory is that the um, toxicity, or effectively the exposure of fish, increases uh, 10 to 1,000 fold with chemical dispersion compared to no dispersion. And that means then that in an open water system, if you add dispersant, you could increase the volume of water that has a high concentration of oil in it by 10 to 1,000 fold. Right. So effectively, it's it's um, playing a little bit with fire, it might work in your favor and you might be able to dilute out that oil until it's non-toxic, but mm -hmm. you might also have a circumstance where um, some species just happen to be concentrated in the area where the spill is, and so they're going to get a super exposure, and, uh, and that could lead to some, some real problems. So one of the, one of the problems with um, using oil dispersants is they have this system called NEVA, Net Environmental Benefits Analysis, and mm -hmm. so some on-site 
spell commander is supposed to look at a well spell and say, okay, there's a shoreline over there and there's some floating ducks over here and there's some fishing yeah. gear. Um, <laughs> we think there'd be a greater environmental benefit of dispersing that oil in the water column so that those um, valued items are protected. And the problem with that uh, logic is that you can see the things that are on the surface, but you can't see what's below the surface. Right. And so you're kind of taking a chance that there's nothing down there that's going to be harmed and cause greater damage than would be uh, occurring at the surface. Mm -hmm. So um, use of dispersants is much better done way offshore where biological communities are more dispersed and there's less likelihood that you're going to have a, an issue mm -hmm. and um, used with some caution. Um, the ideal way, of course, is but the, the ultimate ideal way is just don't spill your oil. Right. <laughs> you stop the oil from spilling, it's much better. Yeah. If it spills, the next best, absolute best thing is reaction as fast as possible. So you contain it and you, mm -hmm. you clean it up. Now, in an open ocean spill, that's not possible often. Right. And often with uh, high wave conditions, it gets extremely difficult. And that's where the dispersants come into play. And I think the idea is that they play into your area is that. Uh, by dividing the oil into small droplets, you can um, make it more accessible to bacteria. So those are, you know, it's it's one of the tools, but it's one of the tools, like all tools, it has weaknesses, and you have to recognize those weaknesses. Yeah. Is the oil dispersant itself toxic? Yes. There's uh, materials in it which will help it mix with uh, oil. So there are uh, polyphenolics and uh, detergent-like materials, and uh, the... Um, any detergent-like material has the same uh, effect on the gills of aquatic organisms. Um, and also, if even at concentrations that don't directly damage the gills, they get taken up and they have these narcotic-like effects, almost anesthetic-like effects on um, membranes internally, so they can be biomagnified and, mm -hmm. uh, or bioconcentrated. So the, uh, the dispersant by itself is often much more toxic than the dispersion, acutely toxic, than the dispersion mixed with oil. Oh, the oil. The oil literally removes the dispersion from the water. Right. And you've got the dispersion molecules, which is usually an aliphatic uh, tail and an aromatic head. Um, where's the other one? I've forgotten. Aromatic head, sorry, is in the oil, and the aliphatic tail it's, it sticks out. And then that, that creates an um, interaction, particularly with salt water, that allows the oil droplet to remain in suspension and prevents the oil from recall acid. And, um, so those molecules of dispersant are much happier associated with oil than with um, biological tissue, so they're no longer bioavailable. Oh, right. and, uh, mm -hmm. So if you get the dispersant right on the oil, then you don't have to worry about dispersant toxicity. But if you're applying it from an airplane, as they usually do, then of course some is going to get in the water by itself. So right. <laughs> nice. I guess uh, one way to also prevent oil spills is to use oil less. Do you think? Uh, we're heading in the right direction right now with being less focused on fossil fuels. I, I, th I think it's the way to go. Um, being driven predominantly by the greenhouse gas issue. Mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of interesting when you look at the demand curves for oil. Um, they continue to increase over the next um, decades up to the year uh, 2100 because um, other alternate forms of energy are not coming on stream that fast. And oil also provides things like uh, feedstocks for plastics and a lot of the synthetics mm -hmm. that we use in the camera and right. other kinds of, uh, of uh, equipment that we use. So um, the real question is whether or not those demand curves can be changed by these, uh, this new emphasis on um, climate change and greenhouse gas emission control. So.